Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Welcome to our 24th program of 2014. Yes, 24th. In addition to this program, we still right now have another 14 programs to go. And how do you know about these programs or where they're located? On the website, on the right side of the page, it says upcoming events. And if you have a computer or from your cell phones or wherever, you can just go to the page and scroll down and see what programs are taking place and where they might be. You may know somebody in another city where these are taking place, and you may want to inform them in advance of where they can you know, go to watch one of these programs. We've extended, we've expanded our operation now to where, where we are outside the state of Florida. We are now in Alabama, Georgia, and North Carolina as well. And coming up in September, October, and November, we just got a grant to do four programs in those areas. So we are expanding. We have people on the ground that are already going around building the databases and getting it going. So that way we can bring these Florida programs to those areas as well. And eventually we'll get out of those states and move a little bit further north. So enough about that too. For tonight's program, let's just get into this now because you all have been waiting long enough. First off, for anybody that's not, that is wearing one of these or wanted to be gluten-free and already told us about it, you needed to get this from our registration desk outside, you'd have to go out there and get it from her. Or a green band, for anybody that registered with us that you're a vegetarian, you're gonna need to get that. Did you get yours? That's good, okay. The doctor has to be checked on also. All right, for tonight, like all of our programs, we must thank those that give us the grants to do these programs. We rely on the pharmaceutical industry, and the pharmaceutical relies on us to be able to provide these kinds of programs, educating the MS patients. That is exactly what we want to do and will continue to do. So for tonight's program, I, and I hope all of you, will thank Genzyme, a Sanofi company, for providing tonight's grant. Genzyme is the maker of Abagio, and I do want to thank them. In addition to Genzyme, we have Accorda Therapeutics, who makes Ampira. That's the walking pill, for those that don't know. Biogen IDEC, who has Avinex, Tysabri, and Tecfidera. Questcore Pharmaceuticals, who makes Akthar. You'll hear about these drugs and whatnot from the doctor speaking after as well. Infinity Clinical Research is here, and they do a lot of research programs here in Broward County, and we hope that you, if you're not using a medicine, do contact them and see what they've got cooking so that way you can try something. Also, we have Teva Neuroscience. Teva makes Copaxone. So again, I want to thank all these sponsors, and I hope you all do too, because again, without them, we cannot do these programs. Moving things along, we have our format for tonight. We have Dr. Steingo, who's going to speak first. I'm sure most of you in this room know about Brian Steingo, and if you haven't, then you're in for a great program, first with Dr. Steingo, and then, of course, with Dr. Matt Kay. And Dr. Steingo will be speaking about the invisible symptoms of multiple sclerosis, as well as treatment options and a few other things. And then Dr. Matt Kay will be along to speak after we do a Q&A with Dr. Steingo. Then Dr. Kay will speak about how vision is affected by multiple sclerosis. And after he speaks, we'll do another Q&A. So I hope that you're all in for a great night. Oh, and by the way, if you have something to say to a waiter, if they're missing something, just raise your hand. Don't shout out, hey, you, all right? This is not New York. We, don't, we can't say forget about it afterwards. OK? Thank you. OK, well, remember, I'm a New Yorker. I get to say these things. All right, let's get started. Dr. Brian Steingo. So, um, as Stuart's mentioned, that he's done many programs, which I think is amazing. The education you get on the web page, the education you get from these talks, and the YouTube. And I've often found the YouTube very useful. For example, sometimes people will ask me about talking about diet, and you can't spend an hour or half an hour talking about the diet, and I'll, I'll refer them to my YouTube, to one of these that I did previously, where we spent a lot of time talking about diet. And what I'm trying to do, having done about half a dozen of them with Stuart this year, is to do different topics and each time to introduce some different topics. And then we go by the feedback. So the feedback that, that you give us at the end is very important. Uh, so we know what we should include next time. So I don't want to do, last time we did one which is on YouTube, we spent half of it I spent on diet. I don't want to spend time on diet again. We want to do some different topics. I've spoken about treatments before. We've spoken about different aspects at different times. Some of them are on YouTube. We've got specific ones that we're going to talk about tonight. But your feedback is very important for us 
to know what to put in, what we should include next time. You know, this is my introductory slide. I put this as the first slide for everything because we could take any particular area in this land of MS. Remember, we talk about the land of MS. And we could be talking about how you diagnose MS. We could spend an evening talking about that. We could talk about the treatment of MS. It's a huge section. Treating MS when you have your first episode or when you have a relapse. Or we could talk about the disease-modifying drugs. We now have 10 FDA-approved drugs for MS. We could be talking about that. We could talk about the symptoms. And you see, I'll call that the symptom tower. Why is that? Because, you know, there are many, many symptoms of MS. So in this land of MS, the building where you go and deal with the symptoms is it's a skyscraper. And we could spend all night talking about that, and we are going to talk about some of those. And then we could talk about medical support, and that specifically is what you're going to hear from Dr. K tonight, medical support. Other than the neurologist, who might be your pilot through this whole thing, you may see an ophthalmologist or a psychiatrist or a urologist. There can be many other people that are important. And then, of course, social support, which are going to support groups, and even something like this, going out to a meeting, meeting people. I think all these things are very important in the management of MS. And last but not least is self-help. And you know, I've done that quite a few times. That's actually my favorite topic, I think, of all of them. But we're not going to say much about that, except that these two on the bottom here are coincidentally right next to each other, because some of the things you do for yourself can help a lot of the symptoms. And so we're going to talk about invisible symptoms. And uh, let's see, how, how does that show up? Not too good? Can you read some of that? Um, I was playing around with these colors. I'm trying to get the colors right, so I was playing around with these the other night. Um, and what, they, what we're talking about over here now is the invisible symptoms. So this goes with the symptoms section, and it's the invisible symptoms of MS. And you're going to see right at the bottom over here, the MS Society has this brochure, and you're all familiar with it, but you look so good. And we could find a whole bunch of other synonyms for what people say when they sometimes look at you and you actually look good, you don't look bad. You can't tell about some of the symptoms. And so these are symptoms that people think that they might not believe you have the disease. It can cause you to have a loss of confidence. It can break up and ruin relationships. Uh, and in fact, this extends way beyond even, even your family. This extends into society. This even extends sometimes to physicians. I've seen people who've gone to see a physician and say, I have pain. And physicians say, well, MS doesn't cause pain. So you all know that MS, of course, does not cause pain, right? And so they, MS doesn't cause pain, things like that. So these are some invisible symptoms over here. And the first one I'm going to tackle over here is fatigue. And fatigue is a very important symptom of MS, a major cause of disability, and a major cause of disability when we write letters to, the social, to social security. Now, there's different kinds of fatigue that you can get, but it's something uh, which interferes with your activities. It interferes with your usual or desired activities. Here's some important points that often these are things you hear about at the bottom about fatigue. You're lazy. How many people here are lazy? I'm the only one? No, people, people are told they're lazy or they lack motivation or it's psychological. You need to go and see a psychiatrist. I've had a patient like that very recently who went down to a, a university area and the, the neurologist told the patient that it's probably psychological and the patient was most distressed by that. But, so these are all things that you hear even from physicians. This is the seven-step seven fatigue severity scale. I just wanted to show you this is something we can document. So if we wanted to document your fatigue, and this becomes important when applying for Social Security, we would go through these different points. And I'll read some of them to you. You might not be able to see them all the way. It says, my motivation is lower when I'm fatigued. Exercise brings on fatigue. I am easily fatigued. Fatigue interferes with my physical functioning. Fatigue causes frequent problems for me, prevents phys sustained physical functioning, and et cetera. There's seven different problems over there that are very important in your day-to-day -day life. Fatigue interferes with my family function. And we could score you. We could put a score. And we could see what your average score is. For example, if you had scored sevens across the board, a score of seven would be very high. It would be something that if we were applying for Social Security, it would be very important for us to emphasize the severity of your fatigue and how it impacts your life. And there are two kinds of fatigue in MS. So the first kind of fatigue in MS is primary fatigue. That's the type that nobody kind of thinks about outside of people with MS, but it's very important. That is fatigue of MS itself. 
is directly related to the MS disease. We do not understand what causes our fatigue. We don't understand what causes it. Is it a chemical reaction? Uh, are there some lesions in very specific pathways that we haven't identified? We don't know what causes it, but we know it's very important. However, there is an equally important type of fatigue in MS, and that's called secondary MS fatigue. So when you say you're fatigued, we need to look at your situation and say, is there anything else that could be contributing to your fatigue that could help your fatigue? Do you have weakness? It's very important. If you have weakness, you'd require much more energy to walk and get around. Are you deconditioned? How about sleep disturbances and depression and bladder problems and heat sensitivity and medication side effects and other medical conditions? So all these things are very important. If I haven't reviewed these things with you, then I haven't done my job because we might be able to fix some of them. And look how they're all intertwined with each other. When you say, I'm fatigued because I'm not sleeping well, why are you not sleeping well? Because you've got bladder problems. Your bladder's waking you up four times at night. Or you might feel depressed. And then, of course, you could have medication side effects. You're on a new medication that makes you fatigue, antidepressants, anti-seizure medications, all kinds of medications. So we need to look into all these things that are eminently treatable things before we finally say, OK, now let's just give you something for the fatigue. Before we just give the drug for the fatigue, we need to look into all these other things and think about all the other causes. And then if we've found the other causes, we've treated the bladder problem, we've dealt with that, we've dealt with a spasticity that maybe wakes you up with pain, we've dealt with depression, then now we look and say, what do we have for fatigue? Do we have medications for fatigue? And yes, we have some. The oldest one is amantadine, which is an interesting medication that was originally described for flu many, many years ago, and coincidentally was found also to help Parkinson's disease. When they treated patients in a nursing home, gave them this drug to prevent their flu, they got improvement of their Parkinson's disease, and we know also can help people with MS and fatigue. It's a very well-tolerated drug, sometimes can cause a skin rash or blurry vision. It's very rare. I've seen that once. How many times have you seen amantadine? A few times. Not, not often. And I think hallucinations also with amantadine. Yeah, it's, not, it's, a, it's a generally, though, a very well-tolerated drug. But it doesn't work in everybody, so we have to have options. And along came ProVigil and NuVigil. Uh, there were some small studies that were done with those drugs that said it was a benefit in MS. Many insurance companies were rejected. They say there's no FDA-approved clinical trial, and we have to fight with them, and we often can't get it, and then sometimes we end up with Ritalin and other, uh, other stimulants in the amphetamine salt family, Ritalin or others like that. Methylphenidate's a generic, uh, Adderall, Concentra, Concerta. There's a few of these other medications that we uh, use for fatigue. And sleep and MS. So sleep is very important in MS. Now sleep can be disturbed for many reasons. And I said, I've spoken about some of them in the previous slide, that your sleep can be disturbed because your bladder is a problem. Or your sleep can be disturbed because you have pain and spasticity. Or your sleep can be disturbed because you have depression. So you see, we're talking about a whole bunch of different symptoms, how they come into play. So all common symptoms that are somewhat invisible to other people too. Your bladder problem is invisible to someone else. Depression might be visible if it causes you to be withdrawn, or sad, it could be visible, but it's often a symptom that you feel yourself. So this is how they're all overlapping. But this is a specific sleep one that I put in here, and that is sleep apnea. And so there's a questionnaire over here that you see that you can ask people about to see if they have sleep apnea, and they found that sleep apnea was common in MS. Almost 40% of people with MS had some degree of sleep apnea. And sleep apnea is a serious condition. There's a higher risk of strokes, for example, with sleep apnea. And so some of the questions they looked at, some of the risks, were feeling tired, snoring, uh, actually uh, a partner observing the apnea, uh, elevated blood pressure, elevated BMI, the age, the older age of a person, male, commoner in males, with a large neck over the age of 50 and overweight. That would be the classic person. But in other people, if they have some of these other characteristics, sleep apnea could be a problem. So we need to be thinking about that as well from the sleep standpoint. And now pain. Let's talk about pain. So pain is one symptom that when I was first learning about MS, many people say, oh, MS doesn't cause pain. Of course, nothing's further from the truth. And there's many causes of pain in MS. And they are defining pain over here as an emotional and a sensory experience. Because you feel the pain in whatever form you feel it, and there is an emotional reaction to it. It affects the way you respond, maybe to other people, maybe just someone touching you, something as simple as someone touching you, some other kind of reaction not being able to do things, for example, limiting your activities. 
And there are two major causes of pain in MS. There's musculoskeletal pain, which is pain due to muscles and joint problems. So people with MS have muscle stiffness, muscle spasticity, muscle spasms, back pain. They have back pain because they often don't walk well. It puts ad abnormal stress on the back. Uh, they, don't, they limp. And all these things put stress and strain on the back and other joints, the hip joints, the knee joints, etc. And then you can have neuropathic pain. The pain of MS is what we call central neuropathic pain. That means it begins in the brain and the spinal cord, and it's a specific kind of pain. It can be a burning, tingling, sharp, electrical kind of pain. And then the pain can present itself in three different ways. Seen at the bottom here, you can have an acute pain. It means the pain starts suddenly. It can be chronic. It's there for a long time. Or it can be paroxysmal. That means it comes and it goes. A good example of that you'll see, on, you'll see coming up. In a minute, I'll tell you about that one. But here's pain. How do we examine pain? And you can see we use this acronym here. It's called Old Cart. So when you come in with your pain, these are some of the questions we want to know. When did it start? Where is it located? Is it in your face? Is it in your limbs? Is it in your trunk? How long have you had it for? Is it acute or is it chronic? What's it like? Is it an aching pain or is it a burning pain? What aggravates it? What makes it better? What could make it worse? What relieves it? And how have you treated the pain? So these are all questions that are very useful for us to try and localize the pain and what kind of pain it is and try and determine what kind of medications might help you. Let's look at some of the musculoskeletal pains. I referred to some of these, but that could be muscle stiffness, spasticity, tight muscles, joint pain, back pain, headaches. These will all come in this, in this particular group. Now, headaches, headaches are common in people with MS. Now, part of the reason for that is that headaches are, migraine headaches particularly, are much more common in females. The ratio is almost 9 to 1, males to fe females to males for migraine. Well, MS is a disease, like other autoimmune diseases, is more common in females. Therefore, it's not unusual that in people with MS you see a higher rate of headaches than the general population. But most headaches in someone with MS are not from their MS. They're from other causes. It could be from their neck. It could be other causes. And here's some of the, dis the neuropathic pain. We use that word that you see over there called dysesthesias. If you hear that word that we use, dysesthesias means an uncomfortable sensation. And they can be in the limbs, in the, in the arms or the legs. But they can be somewhere else. They could be in the trunk, for example. And so a common one that you might know of is the MS hug. People say they have a, a hug sensation. So an MS hug is a, core, is a type of neuropathic pain. Or you could have this one over here, Lamit sign. That is when people, when you bend your neck, I'm sure many people experience that. When you bend your neck down, you feel this tingling sensation. It's a kind of neuropathic pain. And then this one is very common, trigeminal neuralgia, sharp facial pain. That's one of those pains that are paroxysmal. It comes and it goes. And it can be triggered by eating or swallowing or chewing or wind blowing on the face, something like that. Very severe, brief, recurrent kind of pain. Now for young, this is common pain as people age. Older people may get this from other causes. But if a young person has trigeminal neuralgia, almost certainly that's going to make us be alert to the, to the likelihood of MS. And this is the groups of medications we use for treating neuropathic pain. Two groups of medications. And so the first group is the seizure medications. You're familiar with those. Gabapentin and Lyrica, which work on the same pathway. Carbamazepine is Tegretol. It's an old drug. It's been around a long time. It's very effective, but it has quite a few side effects. And oxcarbazepine is related to that. And then we use antidepressant drugs. And the big popular drug these days is Cymbalta. But in the old days, we used, and we still do use, Elevil uh, and Pamelor, nortriptyline, amitriptyline. That's the two big groups of medications for pain that we have. And musculoskeletal pain. So for musculoskeletal pain, you can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like ibuprofen. They do not work. Those drugs do not work for neuropathic pain at all. You can use antidepressants. You could use spasticity drugs, like we talked about before. If there's spasticity, you can inject Botox into the muscles. And most important is non-pharmacologic measures, exercise, physical, physical therapy, acupuncture, massage, occupational therapy. All these measures are very important in musculoskeletal pain. And this, at the bottom, is the very last resort for all kinds of pain, to use opioids. That's our last resort. These. Most people these days, most neurologists, if, if we get to that stage, are going to be using pain clinics to help us manage the pain. We try and avoid that. We try and use all the other measures before we get to that stage. 
Here's another invisible symptom, cognitive function in MS. Sometimes if you speak to someone for a while, you might be, might be obvious, but not always. Sometimes this could be an invisible symptom. And cognitive problems occur in 40 to 65% of people with MS. So we've spoken so far now, we've mentioned three groups, really it's a little more than three groups of, of invisible symptoms, namely fatigue, pain and sensory symptoms, I'll put that together, the pain and the sensory symptoms, and now cognitive symptoms. And the great majority of patients with MS that go on disability, what do you think their cause of disability is? Is it the visible symptoms? Is it that someone says, I'm having trouble walking? Those symptoms, those invisible symptoms, are the most important symptoms for people getting disabled and getting out of the workforce, those so-called invisible symptoms. And so the correlation between cognitive function and other disease characteristics is weak. Someone might have considerable difficulty walking. They might not be able to walk. They might be relying on a wheelchair, and yet they might be as sharp, their brain could be completely sharp, or the opposite. Someone might have absolutely no trouble walking, but they have cognitive problems. So there's no strong correlation between those two. Now the changes of cognitive function can be seen very early on. They've done studies in people who are newly diagnosed. They've just had their first episode, even optic neuritis, and done cognitive testing and find a significant percentage of them in their very first episode already have some cognitive problems. One study even said 40% of people early on. Because, you know, usually with your first symptom, things have gone on for a while. So from early on, there can be cognitive symptoms. And, and early on, what does that mean? Does that mean we need to start treatment early to prevent them from declining? Because cognitive changes, as we said, are very important and a cause of early exit from the workplace. And here's some of the typical functions that are affected in MS, with the cognitive problems of MS. Memory, this is an obvious one, memory, acquiring memory, retaining or, or receiving, and attention and concentration are very important. Those are important functions that are lost. And information processing, executive functions, planning and prioritizing. That's one of the biggest complaints people tell me about how disorganized they've become, and they can't find anything, and things are lying around. And so if someone can train them to become more prioritized and planned, that helps a lot. Visual, visual functions, visual perception, word finding. I just, this is where I took it from, uh, an MS Society document. But so these are the common cognitive functions that are impaired in MS. So if you're going to try and work with the MS functions, these are the ones you want to work with. And this is how you treat it. So the first thing we're saying, because I just told you that early on, a significant number of people, right from day one, they have cognitive problems. Maybe we should treat the MS aggressively early on so we can try and slow the worsening of the cognitive problems that we can't see very well. Because there is no effective symptomatic treatment. That means we have no drug for the memory problems of MS. There is a drug that's used for Alzheimer's disease that's been tried for MS. Two, some, some small studies said it worked. Other studies said it didn't work. As of this day, there is no effective medication that helps. So you could take complementary and alternative medications, such as ginkgo, ginseng, people write about those all the time. But mental stimulation is very important. And that includes word games, crossword puzzles, lumosity. Uh, I, I like this one over here, fit brains. There's a lot of these you can do. You should do them regularly. And down, I'm skipping one for a second, but physical exercise is very important. And then self-help, everything you do for yourself, trying to get organized, trying to plan, have somebody help you. And this all is part of cognitive rehabilitation. If, you get, if this is a problem, then it's always worthwhile to see a neuropsychologist who can talk to you about cognitive rehabilitation and going through all these steps, teaching you retraining some things and compensating for other things. And they can be done. But you have to work with your neurologist or psychologist or somebody to initiate these things as opposed to just saying, you know, I've got a bad memory, i just giving up on it. It's important to do those things. And here's some other things that are very important is physical exercise. It's actually been shown in, some, in, in studies of Alzheimer's disease that physical exercise probably was as important as mental stimulation for maintaining memory. So it's very important to be active. Even if you're in a chair, you can move things, you can move some muscles, so activity is very important. And then a sense of purpose, having something to do, some purpose to the day or the week, having something to look forward to, something to do, a sense of purpose is very important. Hobbies is an example. You can have hobbies, a dietary factor, sleep, stress, laughter. You know, there's, what they say, laughter is the best form of medicine. I don't have a joke for you, but this would be a good time. I guess next time, I may, maybe I'll put a joke in here, but 
There actually have been, the MS Society actually a few years ago at one of their meetings, actually had somebody who was a, a laugh therapist. So it's supposed, to, and then cognitive uh, rehabilitation, we spoke about that as well. So that's the reason I'm showing you these things. These are the invisible symptoms. That doesn't mean that management of these symptoms is invisible. There are things to do with all of them. And that's why it's very important that these symptoms are discussed at the doctor's visit because they might not only be invisible to your spouse and your family members and the bank teller and somebody in Macy's when you buy something uh, or somebody in line behind you at Publix who's, who's impatient because you're slow. It might not only be invisible to those people, but it could also be invisible to one other person. That's your, that's your doctor. Now, sometimes you need to bring these things up as well. That's why making notes at, at the doctor's visit is a very important thing. This is something, I just put a one slide for that later on, but we're going to discuss, at one of our meetings, we're going to discuss the doctor, the, the visit, the office visit, and how to make the office visit of greatest value. Exercise, physical and mental, I told you about that already. You have to be motivated to do exercise, and all these other things have to be available, affordable. These are the exercises you can do. Balance, endurance, stretching, and strengthening. You can do them all. So that's the end of the invisible symptoms uh, that Stuart asked me to concentrate on a little bit today. You probably all could come up with other invisible symptoms. But I think those symptoms, fatigue, pain, sensory symptoms, cognitive symptoms, are an invisible symptoms, and make them visible to other people around you. Make them visible to your neurologist or your other caregivers. If you have family members that are that they're invisible to, bring them with you for the visit. Let them come for the visit. If they don't want to come for the visit, there's a problem. We need to see why they're not coming. But they should come with you to understand how, uh, the severity and importance of these problems. We're going back into the symptom tower now. And we're going to talk a little bit about types of MS and start talking a little bit about treatment of MS. We can't talk about each drug in, in detail because, as you know, if you go to lectures by pharmaceutical companies, you could spend just an evening uh, uh, spending 45 minutes or an hour just talking on one particular drug. So we can't talk about the 10 MS-approved drugs and more coming soon, hopefully. But I just wanted to put this up here about the types of MS. And, you know, the commonest type of MS is what we call relapsing and remitting MS which is about 85% of people present with that kind of MS. Untreated, if people with relapsing remitting MS are untreated, studies in the past have shown that they will go on to develop secondary progressive MS in a high number of cases. And then the bottom two over here are people that have progressive MS right from the beginning. This rare form over here of progressive relapsing where someone's progressed and then all of a sudden has a relapse. But there's two other things on top here that are put. Clinically isolated syndrome, and radiologically isolated syndrome. And these are things we've come up with in recent years. These are the very earliest or first signs of MS. And the radiologically isolated syndrome is when you have no symptoms of MS. You have bumped your head on the wall or something hit you, the baseball, you went to watch a Marlins game and a foul ball hit you on the head, something happened. And you got an MRI scan and, and they look at it and say, wow, it looks, have you ever had any other symptoms? Do you know that you might have MS? Something like that. The scan looks like MS, but you have no symptoms of it. It's a radiological diagnosis. And they have followed these patients now. There's several studies taking people like that early on and following them and a good percentage of them go on to develop MS. Especially if after you look at their brain MRI, you also do a cervical MRI and it is also abnormal. So if you have that, you must have a cervical MRI because if that is abnormal, the risk of developing definite MS is very high. And then the clinically isolated syndrome is the very first episode of MS, uh, which gives us, indicates to us that there's now a high risk for developing further symptoms. So these are risk factors. If you have your first episode of MS, this one needs some work. Can anybody see that beside me? You can't see it? Can you see it? It's going to be on YouTube. It's a surprise YouTube slide. Um, but that's basically what this said. It's an interesting slide, but uh, I have to change the graphics. This is the original. I got this from the original, but I think for, for when there's a light like this, I have to change it a bit. So it said there are some risk factors. If you have your first episode of MS, can we predict overall how, what your course is going to be like? Well, we can't always. You know, MS is an unpredictable disease, and sometimes even with these, we go wrong. But there are six factors over here that they looked at, and they said, how do we predict? And so one of them was the age at onset. The older the age, generally the worse the MS tended to be. The symptoms at onset were important. 
So for example, if you had optic neuritis as your first symptom, generally the prognosis, the outlook was better than if your first symptom was involvement of your brain, of your brain stem or spinal cord. So if you come with your first episode and you have trouble walking or double vision, that outlook is more worrisome to us than if you come in and your first symptom is optic neuritis. And then we look at your MRI scan, the number of spots on the MRI scan makes us worry. If there's a large number of spots early on, that is worrisome. And then the time between the first two attacks. And then how many attacks you have early on, and then the amount of recovery from the attack. So these are all things. So the more attacks there are early, the, longer, the, 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 the less recovery you have, the time between the first attacks, all these things, age, gender, the symptoms, these help us. We pick these, then we put them on a little graph over here, and we say, this is a situation where this may be more aggressive condition, and maybe early on we need to go to some more aggressive medications or be ready to change the medication very quickly. This shows you what I just told you a minute ago about the scans. So let's say you have your very first symptom is optic neuritis and we do an MRI scan. And on the MRI scan there is, one, there is no spots, zero spots on the MRI scan. We're going to say your risk of MS over the next 10 years is about 20%. No spots, 20% risk. So we're not saying you're free of risk, but about 20% risk. However, if you have one spot or 10 spots, your risk is about the same, about 80%. So once you have an MS spot on your scan, you have a risk of developing definite MS. So what's the difference then in the number of spots? The difference in the number of spots is how you turn out at the end. So if you look at this scale over here, the higher we go up in this scale, the more the disability and so you can see that if you have a lot of spots, more than 10 spots, you're more disabled than someone who just had one or three spots. So that's what the spots tell us. So even one spot tells us that there's a high risk for MS, but the more spots you have, we know the higher the risk is going to be that at some time in the future, you're going to be more disabled. Types of MS. So some people with MS, you look around, you know people, they have had MS for 10 years, 20 years, you can hardly tell they have it, it's very mild there may be 10 to 20% of people that have what we call benign MS. Though it's hard to tell this from the beginning, you kind of might say at the beginning, if, on the previous slides, that if you looked at someone, you might say, well, you might have, be a, have a benign course. It doesn't always work like that. This is something we already say most effectively down the road, 10, 20 years. We look at someone at 10 or 20 years. Now, they've actually looked at people, there actually were two studies reported where they looked at people that had MS for 10 years and they were benign at 10 years. And they followed them for another 10 years. And one third of those people that were benign at 10 years had become disabled by the end of 20 years. So, being, so on, with MS, you have to be vigilant all the time. And then 5% of people have this malignant MS, rapidly disabled, wheelchair within a few years, even maybe bed bound in 10 years, rapid disability. Uh, for people with relapsed remitting MS, that 85% group I told you about, they have done studies before treatments were available. And what they found is that at 15 years, 50% 50 have progressed. So if you have MS and there's no treatment, 15 years later, 50% risk of progression without treatment. And 25 years later, 80% risk of progression. So you can see that without treatment, the majority of people are going to progress. And this is studies were done in 1990, published at Mayo, and other studies have been done in London, which confirm the same data that it is important to treat for most people. Now, there are people that I see that have had no treatment for years. They are fortunate. They're in this group. And these are the therapies. That's why we can't spend a lot of time talking about all these therapies, because there are so many that have been approved. So you know the first drug approved for MS actually was beta serum down here in 1993. May 1993, beta serum was, was approved. And as I've said every time we do this, if we were sitting here in April 1993, we would have a blank slide here. So look at the progress. And here's some new drugs. So here now you see all the drugs that are approved. Uh, we started out with the injectables. We got Tysabri, which was an infusion. We got oral medications. The first one was Jelenia. It's now four years old. The next one was Abagio. It's two years old. And then we have Tecfidera. It's over a year old. So three orals. Injectables, infusion, oral medications. And four more medications potentially coming. The closest one is this one over here. This is the one the FDA is currently reviewing, Campath. Alemtuzumab is a highly effective medication, but it also has some significant side effects. When that drug is approved by the FDA, if they have any compassion and brains, uh, it is a drug that we're going to use for only certain people. 
This is not the drug we're starting out with someone who has mild MS, and they need to understand that. And this is what Stuart was involved in getting a petition to them and many other people. Because people that have severe MS, and we've spoken about this disease, can be a catastrophe in someone's life. They need to give us that option of having Campath available or Lemtrida. used to be called Campath. Actually, it's called Lemtrida now. They changed the name. Uh, they have to give us that option. So we're hoping that in the next month or two months, this drug is going to be approved and that we will have it available for anyone with severe forms of MS. And three more drugs over here coming. Ocreluzumab, Ofatimumab, and Daclizumab. So if you look over here, you'll see the common word in all of these is MAB. You see the MAB? MAB, 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 MAB. Tysabri also. Natalizumab, MAB. They're all drugs of a certain characteristic. They're called monoclonal antibodies. So there are antibodies that are made that are going to attack specific parts of your immune system. So there's a whole host of these drugs that are going forward, and they're all potent medications. And here are some experimental medications. So you remember Jelenia was the first oral medication approved. It was approved four years ago. Here's another. This drug, Jelenia, is fingolimod. This is siponimod. So this is in research. Uh, Jelenia has certain side effects. We're hoping with this drug that we might be able to reduce some of the side effects. A T-cell vaccine, studies for that. Mesitinib, ponesimod, similar drugs, all from the fingolimod Jelenia family. And then studying more about these things over here. I put them down as medications. They're so important. Vitamin D. Vitamin D, when, I, when we do the dietary talk, I emphasize vitamin D because vitamin D is a lot more than just a vitamin. It's probably a very important in the immune system. And statins, what about statins in MS? You hear about that all the time. There are studies that have been published in statins, that people with MS benefit from taking statins. And a recent study in Europe showed that people who took statins with progressive MS, their MS slowed down. One of the problems is that it was a very high dose of statins. And there have been studies that have shown the opposite too. So this is all under investigation. And common antibiotics, tetracyclines, doxycycline, common antibiotics used for skin conditions and other things, have some effect on the immune system. And if these things, if there could be more studies on these, these are a lot cheaper than all the others we're talking about. So there are some studies, but these are older medications, and so the studies uh, require funding. They take a long time to do. But there's stuff going on, and then, of course, what we, this is experimental medications, and what we could put over here also, of course, is stem cells, research going on on stem cells, whether it's adipose stem cells, meaning using your own fatty tissue, or you could do bone marrow, use actual stem cells from the bone marrow. Both of these things are being studied. Very expensive studies. That's why they take a long time to do. So those are the, called the disease-modifying drugs. Some people call them DMDs, disease-modifying drugs. Some people call them DMTs, disease-modifying therapies. Uh, and in all the studies with CIS, remember I told you before that CIS is the very first symptom of MS. It's your first symptom. It's optic neuritis. We don't even know you have MS. If you treat people early on with CIS, then you slow down the progression of their disease and you slow down the time they get their second episode. And there are multiple trials with that to show that you slow down the progression of the disease if you treat someone early on. And these are the goals of treatment. So these are the goals that are obvious. Reduce the frequency of relapses. Slow down the progression of disability, which probably is the most important thing to slow disability. And then reduce MRI activity. Those are the three major goals. When clinical trials are done, those are what are important. If a clinical trial is done, the FDA goes to a drug company or a drug company goes to the... Uh, Ten? Thank you. So the, the pharmaceutical company goes to the FDA and says, we want to prove that this particular drug works. The FDA says, you have to prove certain things. You have to have what's called an end point. And these are the ones they usually look at. Does the drug reduce the frequency of relapses? Does it slow progression of disability? Does it have a positive effect on the MRI? If you compare the MRI of the, per of the patient to someone not on the drug, is the MRI going to look better? And you look at these things, so we look at those for clinical trials, and you need to look at them when you start a medication. Any medication you start, you look at those three things. And when you switch a medication to a new medication, you look at those things again and say, does it meet all these criteria? And these are some little side things that can happen. You're trying to prevent, if, you, if you're slowing all these things down, hopefully there'll be less problem from symptoms. We want to give you something where you're going to make sure, we can make sure you're going to take the drug. And we want to make sure that it has long-term efficacy and safety, that it works for a long time and has good safety. And more and more we're trying to develop drugs that have that. Currently we have some drugs that have very, very great efficacy but some safety issues. And going forward we want to con con continue maintaining efficacy but try and improve our safety profile. 
So this over here says that these are the things you look at when you start any medication. We spoke about some of them already. We said you need to look at safety of the drug. So in starting someone a drug, you have to say to them, what is the most important thing for you? Is it safety or is it efficacy? Do you want the most powerful drug and you're prepared to accept that there could be safety issues or do you want to look for safety and maybe have a little less efficacy? And then how about tolerability? Will the drug cause site reactions? Will it cause flu-like symptoms? Will it cause depression? How will I tolerate the medication? And then what about monitoring? How do we monitor for this drug? Do we have to do regular MRI scans? Do we have to do blood tests? What do we have to do for monitoring? And then screening. What is necessary before we start the drug? Do we have to do blood tests? Do we have to go and see Dr. K for some eye exams? Do we need an EKG? What are the screening tests that we need beforehand? And then cost. You think that one could be important? Probably the most important one, really, because it doesn't matter what I say sometimes. Insurance companies say, no, you can't have this. And we can fight, and we can hang up the phone, and we can fight, and hang up the phone, and scream. Uh, sometimes they just have their own, for, for no good reason, their own sequence of prescribing a drug, and we just have to follow it. So cost, convenience, or other items, and then the risks and the benefits. Weigh up the risks and the benefits. And what I'd say to you, besides weighing up the risks and the benefits of a drug, you also need to weigh up the risks of the drug versus the risks of the MS. And of course, comes into play up here again. Uh, if your MS is very active, then you might say, I'm prepared to accept a drug that's got more risks for more benefits because the risks of the MS are very severe. This MS is progressing and starting to cause severe disability. So you also look not only at the risks of the drug, but also the risks of the MS. How active is it? How is it progressing? And these are all the things that come into play when you make a treatment decision on a medication. So making a treatment decision isn't just sitting on a chair and saying, well, I like this drug. It's you know once a week injection. I like this. Or I like a pill. It's convenient. We have to look, look at all these things, really, that we should be thinking about. And you've seen a lot of this on the prior slide, right? Again, safety, efficacy, tolerability, convenience, monitoring. But there are other things, pregnancy issues. You use different drugs, maybe in a woman of childbearing age. How does the drug work? Mechanism of action. Uh, you know, your physician might prefer one drug over another. You might prefer one drug over another. And then do we just look at the evidence? Or do we use experience as well? So all these things are things that could come into play. All these things are included in the slide. If you look at YouTube, you'll just see it. It's complex when we make a decision about what the best drug is for you. Now, what we ideally want to do going forward is personalize your drug for you. Find what's best for you. It's called personalized medicine or individualized medicine. What's the best drug for you? We'd like to be able to do that. In order to do that, we need to know some more characteristics about you. Maybe about your genes, your genome, your genetic pattern. Maybe we need to know about that. Or maybe something, something more about your immune system. These, this is all information we're slowly gathering. So maybe in the future, we'll be able to predict that you are going to be a responder to drug A, or you will be a responder to drug X. That would be a, an excellent situation. We don't have that yet. This is our goal going forward. And now when do you switch a drug? So you've been on a medication, how do you know when to switch? These are some of the things that are happening. You could be having the same three things we just talked about. That's why I emphasize them all the time. You're having relapses. Your disability has progressed, your MRI scan is worse. And now you're saying, now is the time for me to switch to another medication. And when you switch to the other medication, then you go back to the prior slide, and you look in the new medication, you go all over all those steps again. Is it safe, efficacy, tolerability, Cost, convenience, risks, monitoring, screen, go through that whole slide again. This slide should be your companion. Uh, anytime there's issues with your MS, you're talking about switching, starting, switching drugs. Those are all important considerations. Uh, and then one other thing that's important. So we spoke about when you start and when you switch, you need all those tables. But the one other issue that could become important for us is what we call sequencing. That means which drug follows another drug. For example, if you're on a certain drug that may lower your white cell count, it might delay when we can start another drug. So it might have an effect that you can't add another drug until that effect is worn off, for example. So that might depend on how the drug works. So we might have to have an, an exit strategy. What's the effect on the immune system? What happens when you come off the medication? When you come off Tysabra, you have a risk of relapses that start to peak at about the third month. So there could be disease rebound. We have to think about how are we going to manage the rebound of the disease. When are we going to start the new medication? How long do we wait? What are the risks of two medications at the same time? So all these questions with these new potent medications now are becoming very important questions. 
And then just some, this slide over here on all the other things we think about when we put you on a medication. What other conditions do you have? Comorbidities. Are you diabetic? Do you have heart disease? Do you have depression? Maybe some drugs cause increased depression. We need to know about those. How severe is your disease, your medical and family history? What's your risk tolerance? Just a different way of looking at it. Childbearing potential, JC virus antibody status. What's your immune system like? Your medical history, all these conditions could be important in your medications because some of them have side effects on some of these medical conditions. So we need to know about them. And your lifestyle considerations, you may travel. So some drug might be more important for you or more easy for you to use than another drug. And the monitoring that shows you what you might need to do to monitor. I'm not going to go through them all, but this could be all the blood tests we need to do. It might be a blood count, it might be your liver, it might be your thyroid. It could be your heart, it could be your eyes, it could be blood pressure, it could be many different things we're using to monitor you. And this again over here, safety and tolerability. Look at all these things that could happen. So these are lots of things that could happen. Flu-like symptoms, depression, the drug could be toxic to your liver. Almost every MS drug has at some, at some point some report of some toxicity to the liver. You could have injection site reactions, lipoatrophy, PML, on and on and on. Potentially when you go forward with these drugs that are working on the immune system down the road, could there be a risk of infections or malignancies, especially with these new drugs? These are things we're vigilant for. We haven't seen them in the early stages, but they're all things we have to be wary of. If you take chemotherapy drugs for chemotherapy, Imuran, Celsept, other chemotherapy drugs for cancer, lymphoma, leukemia, down the road, people 10, 20 years later have a higher risk for getting other cancers, especially lymphoma. So we need to watch and see, could this happen with some of the newer MS drugs? Um, Stuart says I have, I have a minute. Okay, so um, just a quick slide to talk to you about adherence. It's so, it's so obvious when you say that, but I've been to other talks where people have said that. If you don't take the medication, guess what? Exactly. And, and you know, it sounds, doesn't that sound so obvious? But you'd be surprised. I see people will come into the office and they haven't seen them for nine months and they come in and they're not doing well and we say, okay, you've been on medication X for two years and obviously it's not working, at which time you will get that little look and that little glance that'll say, well, I'm not really taking it. And I'm saying, why? Sometimes it's injection site reactions. Sometimes it's just, I don't tolerate it. Sometimes it's the insurance company. It's not, no longer on my plan. And I'm saying, well, pick up the phone. We can work something out. These companies are a competitive world out there. They often have programs to help you one way or another. So that should never happen. If you can't get the drug, we need to know about it. We need to work something out. If there's no insurance, if you have a bill to pay, something needs to be worked out. Because if you neglect your MS and you get into a wheelchair, it's a bit late to work something out. We want to work it out before you get disabled. We want to try and stop you from getting to that stage, if we can. So adherence, actually, you can see the adherence rate. In this study over here, I think this is a Canadian study, the adherence had, had dropped down at two years to about 40 to 50% with injectable drugs. And why is that? This is why we think people that had MS in the past, this applied in the past, that people had, didn't like the needles, they thought the drug wasn't working. How do you tell if it's working? Only by time. You can't tell. These are not drugs you can tell quickly. The way you tell if it's working is by time. You're not having relapses. You haven't progressed. Your MRI scan has got the same three things again. That's how you tell if the medication's working. So people might say, I don't think it's working. I don't feel better. Or they might say, I feel depressed. Maybe it's not working. But there are symptoms. Then we go back to the symptom tower, and we need to address all the symptoms. In order to make your visit with your neurologist and probably any other physician that you have valuable. This is, the, this is maybe the most important slide of all of them. Um, so the office visit, the, the office visit is, is a most important thing to talk about because your whole care centers around this particular situation. When you go and see a neurologist, you have a certain amount of time, okay? I try and spend time with people. Sometimes we're lucky, everything's smooth, it can go quickly, sometimes it can't. So people that need a lot of time can buy time, thank you, buy time from someone who maybe needs less time. But to make the visit valuable, these are things that should be addressed and you should write them down. So when you come in, in our office, for those of you who come to my office, we give you a sheet of paper and it has these things on it. It says, why are you here today? What is your chief complaint? What's the reason for your visit today? You could say, checkup, annual checkup, no new symptoms, it's great. So now I'm happy and you're happy. Or you could say bladder problems, or fatigue, or whatever you're saying. So it's very important to know your chief complaint. 
And underneath that, we list all the symptoms that you have. Numbness, tingling, weakness, bladder problems, bowel problems, they're all in there somewhere. Fatigue, memory problems, vision problems, double vision, everything's listed. So I can look at this in one second, literally in two seconds maybe, and I can see exactly what the physical and mental complaints are. And then the second thing we ask you is, what are your medications and your supplements? And that means I emphasize this. All your medications and your supplements. And people often leave it blank. I don't know why. Or well, they write the same. Now, what does the same mean? In this situation, the same means usually only one difference. Or two, maybe three. It means it's not a lot of differences, but the chance of the same being the same is most unusual. Think about it. People with MS have a chronic disease. Sometimes they have other conditions. If they're old MS patients, they might be diabetic. There's almost always something that's changed. And they could interact. I need to know about interactions. So write down all your medications. Write down your vitamins and your supplements. Some of them might be bad for you. Or they might not be enough. You might be taking vitamin D, and I'm going to say, that's a low dose. Let's check it. So we need to know all your medications and supplements. Um, make a list, take your own list, take it home with you. And Stuart and I are working on putting something, uh, at some point you'll see some, some further information about this. Questions. What are your questions? That's very important. So after you put all your symptoms and you put on your medications, you're going to say, these are my questions for today. So now think about this. I take this piece of paper and I can look at this piece of paper in 22.5 seconds and your visit is now planned. We can make this into a highly efficient visit. Instead of talking about one thing and then flying off to another thing, and the worst symptom is the door symptom. Are you all familiar with the door symptom? The door symptom, the door, D-O-O-R. The door symptom. The door symptom is when you spend half an hour with someone and you're standing at the door about to leave and they say, I forgot to tell you about my bladder. Well, the bladder is not a one second symptom, never. You can't discuss it, you haven't got, it wasn't listed. So write them down. So what we do in our office is when people check out the time before, we give them this form, we say take it home until you come next time, three months, six months, 12, whenever you come back. Fill it in before you come. So you don't have to sit and think about it when you're sitting outside in the waiting room. And then guess what happens? You forget. You forget. I saw someone today who I spent some time with. Um, and then she left. And then she came back and handed the secretary a note and said, I forgot to tell you I have difficulty swallowing. I'm sorry to hear that. But, you know, what can I do at that point? I can't spend another 40 minutes with you. And then finally, sometimes I'll summarize it. So sometimes, with, sometimes when I have the time or we, or we speak about this, I'll say, okay, you've had your visit over here. We've discussed all these things. Now you tell me what, what did I write down in my note for you to do? And it might say, one, uh, continue disease modifying drug. Two, check vitamin D level. Three, exercise. Four, stop eating salt. Five, stop smoking. This is what I want you to say to me. Give back to me the things that we've discussed. So that, that's, that's uh, the office visit. I, th I think that's the most important thing, and that's what I'm going to end on. Thank you. So for Q&A, I don't know if you all noticed, but I was eating a lot of bread, and I need to work it off. So I'm going to be running around back and forth through the room to answer questions. We won't make it too difficult, though. If I cannot get to part of the room, then you just raise your hand, and Dr. Steinger will pick on you to uh, answer your question, if you have one. So, who wants to begin? Come on, it's gotta be at least one. Here we go. Hi, Dr. Steingo. Uh, I was always told, and I don't know whether it's still true or not, that there's no real correlation between lesions and where the lesions are and your symptoms. I have no new lesions, but symptoms keep getting worse. I've been on Avonex since August of 96. Is it time for a change? <laughs> Great question. Uh, I mean, you know, you know the answer, so. I mean, you've been on Avonex 18 years and you're getting worse. Is it time for a change? Yes, it's time for a change, but one of the concerns I would have is what kind of MS do you have? If you've had it for so long and you're progressing, do you really have, do you still have relapsing MS? Uh, if you still have relapses, there's all these options we talked about, but after this many years, could this be potentially secondary progressive MS? 
for which we only have one FDA-approved drug even now, which is Novantrone, which is a miserable chemotherapy drug that hardly anybody uses. So in that situation, I would hope you're still having a relapsing MS. The answer, of course, if you're getting worse, is to make a change. Like I've told you, with all these drugs, we, meet, we need to make changes sooner. The MRI does not always correlate with how someone is doing. Sometimes it does. If you look at the spinal cord, there's a much better correlation. The spinal cord is a very much smaller structure. The brain is huge. There are silent areas in the brain. So sometimes you can correlate it, sometimes you can't. You know that often you look at a new scan and there's new lesions, but someone hasn't had a new symptom. Or the opposite can happen too. And then there are silent areas. Sometimes someone has a new symptom. It might be in the gray matter of the brain that we don't visualize very well. Sometimes we just do a brain scan and the problem is in the spinal cord. We miss it. It's not done. The whole scan is not done. So there are different things that can happen like that. Any questions here? Do any of the drugs help with the fatigue issue? So, so these drugs, not directly. The fatigue issue was those medications that are listed as a symptom. So these drugs potentially, if, if a drug would slow down the progression of your MS, stop you from having relapses, slow down the progression of your disease, and then you did exercise and everything else that I spoke about over here, then you could potentially improve your fatigue. But none of these drugs directly improve fatigue. Any questions on this side of the room? Okay, uh, up there, they have the name atriptyline. My neurologist gave me that, and I, I'm not exactly sure what a doctor is up for, but I did have leg problems with sleeping, and he gave me that. I don't know. I mean, I took that thing one time, and it knocked me out. And the next day, I had a hard time waking up. Yes, the question is about amitriptyline. We spoke about that. It's an antidepressant. It's an old antidepressant. It's been around for a long time. Uh, you can use it as an antidepressant. But what we use it for in MS frequently is for pain. MS pain, the kind of pain we talked about, burning, tingling, stinging, electrical pain. That's often what we use it for. Uh, we can start in a low dose. We build it up. Some people do get tired, uh, but some people tolerate it very well. So it is, it is a commonly used medication. Less and less with new drugs, but we still do use it. Any other questions over here? Okay, great. That's what I like to see. By the way, we offer for anybody that you know somebody else that might be hearing impaired, this is a service we provide for the programs. Hi, I just wanted to know, it sounded like there's an update on Lemtrada. No, I mean, the update is the company reapplied. In May, they researched. So Lemtrada, for everybody who's listening over here, Lemtrada is a new drug for MS. It's a very, very good drug for uh, more aggressive forms of MS, very potent medication, uh, but it also at the same time has some side effects, uh, can expose someone to other autoimmune diseases. But it would be used, the, the way we would use it would be for aggressive form, more active forms of MS, or someone who's failed a lot of medications. The, the company uh, initially went to the FDA almost a year ago, and the FDA turned it down. It was approved in Europe, in Canada, in Mexico, in Argentina, in Australia, it's approved all over the place, but it's not approved in the US. So the company resubmitted in May, and we're hoping in the next month or two that the FDA will approve it. Uh, and we fully expect that they're going to put some strict uh, management in place, just like we have with Tysabri, and they should. And we expect that, and we will know how to use it. The decision, though, should be between patient and physician in a situation, uh, looking at all these things we talked about. What's the risks? What's the benefits? How do we monitor this? We know we're going to do all those things. Let us do all those things. So, no, there's no update. We're hoping in the next month or two to hear. Hey, Dr. Stengo. Hi. Um, i got a question to ask you. If you're using Rebif for a while, five years, and all of a sudden you're um, becoming more anemic, um, iron, less iron, even your reserve iron is depleted, gone. And if she's a, and you've already gone through colonoscopy to make sure there's no bleeding, no nothing. Okay, should she be introduced to more iron supplemental? Yeah, the, the, so the, the commonest cause um, of iron, when someone is, has an iron deficiency anemia, it's very important to make sure that there's no bleeding. The commonest cause of iron deficiency is bleeding. So it's more common in women bleed from menstruation. Uh, if it occurs in a man, if a man has an iron deficiency anemia, they have to be thoroughly investigated to make sure there's no bleeding in the colon or the gastrointestinal tract, or that they don't have some other disease, some kind of 
bone marrow disease that's causing them to be anemic. But if all those things are, are uh, ruled out and you're iron deficient, then you can supplement with iron just to get the anemia up. But it's a good question because there are some people who feel that, that iron deposition uh, is actually responsible for many neurological diseases, including has a role maybe in MS or Parkinson's disease. They've studied the brain and found areas of iron deposition. So I think you don't want to take uh, heavy doses of iron. You want to, uh, it depends how low, the, how bad the anemia is. Sometimes somebody like that, they might recommend a transfusion first. So you get a good supply, get the blood up, and then start building up a little bit of iron. But monitor it carefully. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Stango, you have mentioned uh, vitamin D a couple of times. And how often do you recommend uh, having your blood checked for vitamin D level? You know, so you get the baseline level and you see what it is. Uh, if it's in a good range, and for MS, our goal is to aim for about 75. So most labs give a range of 30 to 100. Some have their own range, but most are 30 to 100. And so we're looking for a, we're looking for a 75. And so a, a early on, if you do your first test in 75 and you're taking 2,000 units a day, that'd be good. I might only do it in six months. But if your level is low or high, and I'm busy working with your dose, I might do it every three months until I get it to be stabilized. And then after that, maybe every six or 12 months once it's stabilized. So as with everything else, more frequent early on until we're trying to get to that level and then less frequent after that. Any other questions? Yes, too. <laughs> I have a frog there. I think it was a squirrel instead. Hi, doctor. Hi. Uh, I'm newly diagnosed and... Probably closer than that. Sorry. Um, and my question is regarding an article I read last week actually on your group. Um, typically when someone comes in and they show signs of physical disability, do you test for Lyme disease? And what are the correlations? I've noticed that some of the symptoms are very similar between Lyme disease. And how do you, do you test people for that when you're doing your diagnosis? And have you had people come across people that have Lyme as opposed to MS? Yeah, so when you first diagnose MS, there there is no diagnostic test for MS. You can't do a blood test for MS. You can look at the scan. It looks like MS, but other conditions mimic MS. There are many mimics for MS. Lyme is one of them. Lupus, Sjogren's disease, sarcoidosis, uh, there's a bunch of them. And so when someone is newly diagnosed, we should do just all the lab work to rule out all those tests, including Lyme disease. And so with the Lyme disease test here in South Florida, it's a rare thing. It would be very rare. It would be if someone said, you know, for the last six months ago, I was up in uh, New England or somewhere, or some area where there's, where there's ticks, then you definitely would be more inclined to do it. But if you live in Long Island, you definitely need to do that test. With Lyme disease, in areas where it's very common, you need to do that test. But over here, it's one of the tests that we do. And it should be done here. Lyme, lupus, sarcoidosis, B12, we check the B12, a bunch of different things. Should all be done at the beginning, yes. And my, my other question is, is it absolutely definitive by MRI, or do you generally do spinal tap as well to determine? If someone has a classical MRI, that's all they, I, I don't do a spinal tap. I very infrequently do spinal tap. It would be if someone had a suspicious, very, very suspicious symptoms and the scan just wasn't classical enough, and I might do a spinal tap, but it's not a frequent thing. It's fairly infrequent that I would do a spinal tap these days. I'm to know, how come all these drugs can get approved out of the, uh, our country and, and they work and we can't get anything uh, approved and it takes forever? So what you're trying to say is if you have money, you go out of the country and, and get it. <laughs> well, you have to be monitored. I mean, Lem Trotter, for example, some people did go out of the country to get it. But then how do we monitor them? And the monitoring of Lem Trotter is very important. Lem Trotter is the drug we're talking about for aggressive forms of MS, it's only given for one week, one week a year. You get five infusions for one week and you're done for the year. But the drug can cause problems with the thyroid gland and platelets and the kidneys and things like that. It needs to be monitored. So how do we capture people? How do we, how do we make sure they keep their follow-up? So if you go overseas, how do we make sure we do that is the problem. But I think the problem is that in the past, the FDA has been burnt by approving drugs that subsequently had problems, even Tyce Abri. Uh, some people said you approve these drugs too soon. So now they're going the opposite way and they, and, they, and they take their time. 
what they need to do is say, okay, we understand there could be risks and put in a whole bunch of risk management strategies. That's what they need to do. We're hopeful this time it will happen. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know. That's the only thing. It's just their fear of what happened in the past. Uh, I'm just curious. Oh, thank you. Um, our daughter had difficulty walking and um, muscular uh, problems. That got much better, and she's very active and can walk. But now she has sensory MS and can use her hands, and she walks fine, but no feeling, tingling, numbness, disappearing. I, I you know, we, I mean, that's uh, any, anything can happen in MS. Any, you know, so uh, if you look, any anything that anything from the the, the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord and the optic nerves. And anything that affects those structures can cause symptoms, whether it's motor symptoms or weakness or spasticity or sensory symptoms and pain and loss of feeling and balance problems. And I mean, any, anything can happen, it's unpredictable. And they can all be disabling. Sensory symptoms can be as disabling. If you can't feel your feet when you're walking, it can be as difficult to walk as when you can't move them or when you have weakness. So they're all important. I think I'm done. All right. Any other questions? Oh, boy. We only have time for one more. Two more. So, two more? Two more. Okay. Two more. Hi, Dr. Steingo. Um, you mentioned the statins, and <clears throat> you said they had mixed results with high-level doses of statins, but the FDA now has black, black labels for our over 80 milligrams and even 60 milligrams on statins because of it increases muscle deficiency. Right. So I'm just wondering, like, for people with MS who have spasticity and other muscular problems, how would statins work? Yeah, it's a big problem. So, 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 the, so I mean, the only thing about statins for MS is that they're they're cheap drugs. They're much cheaper than all these disease-modifying drugs. But that's exactly the problem with statins. Number one, the dose they use is very high, like you said. Number two, statins can cause liver problems. And a lot of the MS medications can cause liver problems too. And statins, besides muscle weakness and muscle breakdown, can also cause nerve problems, even loss of feeling. So they're, they're far from perfect drugs in the situation. And there was one study uh, reported from Minnesota where they said that statins and patients on Rebif who took statins actually did worse in that combination. So I think statins are just something we're playing, that people are playing around with and doing studies. And did recently publish a paper last year in the Copenhagen meeting where they said that statins seem to slow down the progression of secondary progressive MS. So people are excited about that. But again, it's a small study. It hasn't been repeated. And how would it play into what you've said? It's got a black box. And a lot of these drugs have black boxes anyway for the liver. So it would be a big problem. Again, it's one of those things where we have to weigh up the risks and the benefits. If, if it was a slam dunk effect that was you know, a very marked effect, it would be something to think about. But it isn't at that stage. I would not give it to someone just for their MS. At all. Yeah. I have one question about uh, what nerves are specifically covered with myelin. Not all nerves are covered with myelin. Besides the legs and the arms and the hands, are the optic nerves the one that moves your eyes? Well, Dr. K is going to tell you about that. Okay. And is there any other any uh, other nerves yeah, that are covered uh, by myelin? Yes, m most of the nerves. I mean, like the large motor nerves are covered with myelin. Um, all, most of the long nerve pathways are myelinated nerves. But there are some sensory nerves, for example, certain types of pain fibers that are not covered with myelin. All right, mo so most of the nerves that we're talking about at the MS are covered with myelin. That's it. So let's thank Dr. Steingo for coming on. So you know where we're up to, right? Again, I want to thank the company that gave us the funding to do today's program. That would be Genzyme, a Santa Fe company. Genzyme is the maker of Abagio, which there are people in this room currently using. And like Dr. Steingo was speaking about, Lemtrada, they are hoping to get onto this market in the near future. So we do want to thank them again.